I know we started that parallel session a little bit late, but to be fair to Ezekiel, we also need to give him a fair chance. So our next presentation will be done by Ezekiel Borrow, and he will present on the role and impact of faith-based organization in the management of and response to COVID-19 in low resource settings. And then um, with regards to Ezekiel, you will also find his profile on the website, but he's a fellow at the Ahimsa Fund and a global health professional with interest in health innovation and governance or business models, processes and policies at local and global levels that increase access to health technologies in low and middle income countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, is also broadly interested in global health policy making and advocacy. So Ezekiel, thank you very much for being here. We're looking forward to your presentation. If you have a screen to share, you may do it now and then you may present your paper. Thank you very much, um, Jacques. Can everyone hear me fine? All right, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, we're truly really grateful for um, this opportunity and privilege given to us to present our policy and practice paper at the RCMST um, conference. Um, I'm joined this morning. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm based here in Geneva, Switzerland, but I'm joined this morning by um, colleagues from the IHIMSA Fund. We have the founder and president of the IHIMSA Fund here with us, Jean Francois. We have Olivia as well. And I have um, some of my um, my co-authors here as well, some of them. We have Tan Visapra, and um, I think we have Dr. Arianat Ratney here as well. And hopefully we'll have um, some other co-authors here um, who will join us for this presentation. As um, Jacques has said, um, the title of our presentation is the role and impact of the phase based organizations in the management of and response to COVID-19 in low resource settings. I'll just quickly share my slide. Um, can everyone see my slide? Yes, we can. I think you must just open it up as a presentation because we can also see your smaller slide at the left pane. Ah, okay. Uh, let's see. You should just click on presenting. Better, better now? Yeah, better. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, yes, as I said, I'm joined by other um, co-authors and this is really a, a collaborated, collaborative effort between the IMSA Fund and also um, experts, um, faith-based actors who are experts in the various countries that they um, work in, um, from Pastoral de Criance in Brazil, Salvadaya, Shramadana Movement in Sri Lanka and Muhammadiyah in Indonesia. Um, my colleague Tanvi Sapra will be starting off the presentation and then I will um, join later on um, to finish up. Just wanna say a big thank you first to Dr. Jennifer Eggett for the wonderful presentation that you have given on to us, which is also going to, I mean, I'm gonna speak a little bit to that as well in the course of our own presentation. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy the presentation. So I hand over to Tanvi now. Sure. Thank you, Ezekiel. So to begin with, uh, we'll just be highlighting the objectives of our paper. Um, so our main aim was to highlight the role that and impact that faith-based organizations have had in the pandemic response. Uh, basically, we focused on three organizations based out of Brazil, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka. We further went on to identify the gaps and challenges that these organizations face in the various interventions uh, that they introduce in their communities. And lastly, we'll also uh, ponder over some of the opportunities for greater engagements with these faith-based organizations to maximize their contribution and impact uh, in future outbreaks or pandemics. So moving on to what uh, the role of a faith-based organization is in pandemic response. Um, in times of great uh, misery and difficulty, like the pandemic that we are all uh, facing, uh, uh, faith and religion, it plays an important source of hope and strength to many uh, around the world. These organizations, they formed 
um, a bedrock for the pandemic resource uh, pandemic response in many resource constrained settings by supporting people mentally physically spiritually and uh, also in their psychosocial well being uh, this was also recognized by global organizations like i'm sorry is can you not hear me well i just thought the chat I, I can hear you well, Tanvi. I'm okay. not sure if it may be connection problems on the other side, but I can hear you fine, okay. so you can continue. Okay, great. great. Yeah, so uh, as I was saying, global organizations like UNICEF and WHO, from the beginning of the response, they have uh, published certain guidelines and recommendations developed in collaboration with faith-based communities, which just goes to show the role that these faith big the faith big uh, universe um, organizations play in crisis management so the first organization that we had the opportunity to work with is called pastoral the tienka which is based out of brazil it's a catholic faith based organization which serves to provide health and nutrition services to all children and women in brazil regardless of their religious affiliations so just even before the pandemic they had come up with an innovative uh, mobile application called home visit in uh, various languages this uh, application can even work offline when there is very limited uh, internet connectivity and then sync data to the cloud after connectivity is restored so this even helps it operate in the most remote regions of uh, brazil so some of the salient features of the app were that you can share guidelines on health and nutrition with families via email bluetooth and whatsapp uh, there was a two way chat communication between users and app coordinators and it also supports various e training programs on health nutrition hygiene child development during the pandemic they also introduced more um, e training programs uh especially a program on fight against coronavirus to uh, stop the spread of mis and disinformation using reliable resources like the who so this helped uh, a lot of people in brazil to uh, gain that proper information so the next organization that we worked with was mohabadia which is based in indonesia it is one of the most uh influential faith based organizations in india indonesia and around the world some of their uh, some of the highlights of their covid response uh included providing more than 500000 uh, personal protective equipments to hospitals such as surgical grade masks goggles ventilators oxygen concentrators they also provided relief packages to families and small businesses across the community which included food stuff cash assistance and business uh, capital stimulation packages they also developed uh, fatwas on covid-19 vaccines and religious practices uh, which was aligned to the international community health guidelines and co collaborated with organizations such as unilever to offer trainings to students and teachers about personal hygiene um and provided hygiene kits and bought, uh, built water and sanitation facilities lastly the third organization that we worked with was sarvodaya shramadan movement which is based in sri lanka it was founded on buddhist and gandhian principles and they have been uh, addressing the development challenges in sri lanka some of their uh, covid response highlights include supporting the national and international stakeholders with their covid response they also converted all the residential and training facilities into quarantine facilities um and was liaising with the government to um um to support and strengthen a whole of society response to the pandemic they also designed and disseminated risk communication and community engagement guidelines uh, and broadcasted it through different mediums like television radio media channels print media etc lastly they were also uh, responsible for distributing relief and hygiene packages to daily wage workers the vulnerable and poverty stricken communities in sri lanka so i'll be handing over um, 
to Ezekiel now to present some of the challenges and opportunities and take it forward. Ezekiel. Thank you uh, very much, Tanvi. So um, just to first say that the some of the challenges and opportunities that I will be presenting are anecdotal from some of the, um, you know, the encounters that we have had with faith-based organizations in the AHIMSA network, but they're also, some of them will also be empirical, you know, based on um, what's happening um, globally and, you know, what's cross-cutting cross cross across uh, most faith-based organizations. So I think definitely one of the very um, first and import important challenges that they have faced is, you know, funding shortfalls. Um, as Dr. Eggert, you know, said during her presentation, you, you know, many of these organizations mostly um, get their funding, you know, from um, their communities that, they, that they're based in or that they serve. And uh, sometimes this funding is not always sufficient, you know, to address the enormous challenges that, um, that, that, that they are tackling in, in these, env in these em environments. Um, we think that um, there's definitely an opportunity for um, private funders, you know, whether it's five, private for-profit or private non-for-profit funders to plug in some of these funding gaps as long as there are, um, you know, there's an alignment of uh, values and alignment of uh, mission-oriented goals and objectives um, um, between both funders and these um, local organizations. Um, it, also, I mean, for multilateral organizations, there's a need to ensure that funding um, that is allocated goes directly to local faith-based organizations that are proximate to the communities that they serve. And we see that this is an issue, you know, state um, sharing with you a uh, statistics from an organization called the Center for Global Development, they found out in June last year that only 0.07% of all the funding allocated by the, uh, you know, by United Nations agencies, only 0.07% of that money, you know, reached the local, organize, uh, local organizations that are serving the communities that they work in. And we see that this is a big challenge. This is a problem. There's an opportunity to ensure that, you know, monies or funds that are allocated um, for addressing infectious disease, um, crisis management in, in local communities in, in, in low resource settings. We, this money needs to get to the um, um, organizations that are you know, um, directly um, uh, uh, addressing these challenges in the communities that they, that they serve. Um, accountability, transparency, and coherence mechanisms are also you know, insufficient or sometimes they are lacking. As um, Dr. Eggert has already shared, you know, this is for um, a whole variety of reasons. Sometimes it's limited resources, you know, sometimes it's a misalignment of priorities. Um, you know, we, we, we think there's definitely an opportunity here for um, accountability and transparency mechanisms um, uh, to be coherent across various faith-based organizations. And this is not just intra-faith based organizations, but also interfaith based organizations. We think this is important, especially when the overall when the overarching goal is to increase, you know, or to strengthen community resilience. Um, we 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 especially in this pandemic, we've seen a lot of the very, you know, and this takes me to the second to the third challenge. We've seen a lot of siloed approaches and me first approaches in the way um, some of uh, uh, the, the so solutions have been provided or in the way, um, you know, these organizations have tried to, to provide either relief funding or to support the communities that they serve during the pandemic. But we think there's a, an opportunity for, you know, more collaborative approaches, more systematic um, approaches in, um, in the way that, uh, that, that the, the work that these organizations do. Um, also, you know, risk communication and community engagement channels have been insufficient. We've seen that this has been a very big challenge um, in the course of this pandemic. I think we have done better in this current infectious disease um, outbreak. You know, I'm talking about COVID-19. I think we've done, the world has done much better in terms of um, risk communication and community engagement. 
you know, compared to past um, um, outbreaks. And so here I'm talking about Ebola in West Africa and in Central Africa. I'm talking about, you know, influenza in, you know, um, uh, in Southeast Asia. I think with this pandemic, we've done better, but there's still a whole lot, whole lot more that needs to be done. Um, a World Bank report that came out in February this year, you know, showed that only 27% of developing countries already had a strategy or plan for community engagement and for social mobilization strategies, you know, in the countries, uh, in, in low resource settings, in developing countries. And, and you know, this is not acceptable. Um, the, one of the very best ways and opportunities for, you know, improving how this is done is uh, ensuring that faith-based organizations are embedded, you know, in uh, these strategies or in the working groups that are creating these strategies right from the onset of the, uh, of the pandemic. And um, we, we, we definitely think that this is, this is one opportunity where uh, uh, we can rally the expertise and the experience of faith-based organizations because a lot of the, them, you know, their leaders, um, and even the communities, the, the organizations themselves have built trust and they built very strong networks in, uh, uh, in these countries. And so, you know, they're always uh, or usually a very trusted source of, um, uh, information. of, of, of information, uh, you know, and this is so, 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 so important. In our paper, we, we propose something called a trilateral, you know, um, maintenance of communication channels between um, you know, the faith communities and the faith leaders and also the national or international agencies that are supporting um, or leading uh, the, the um, um, crisis management response in, in low resource settings. Another final challenge I want to share, of course, is the access inequities and we see this on a daily basis. This has been, you know, this has, has literally been the case from the beginning of the pandemic, whether it's, you know, um, inequities in accessing um, PPEs or in accessing diagnostic tools or therapeutics, or now vaccines, you know, this is such a big problem. Just yesterday, um, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, the Director General of the WHO, you know, shared in a press conference that um, out of all six months into, you know, into this year, out of all the countries, you know, the high, uh, out of all the vaccines that have been administered, 44% of them, have been administered in high income countries and only 0.4% of them have been administered in you know, low income countries. This is unacceptable. You know, Dr. Tedros has called this a catastrophic moral failure. We think this is an, there's an opportunity here again for faith-based organizations you know, um, to help improve um, the access barriers that exist. As I just said now, they have strong networks, they have trust in their communities, they have um, infrastructure, they have personnel, they have, you know, large network of people who work with them. Uh, we think that there's an opportunity to, to you know, um, double down on, on, on all of these resources that are available and see how to utilize them to increase access in hard to reach communities in various poor countries. Um, I'll just quickly go to recommendations. We don't have recommendations in the paper that we um, uh, uh, have submitted for this conference, but we wanted to share some recommendations just to wrap up our presentation. We, as I've, I've said already, there's a need for more funding. Um, the G20 has been very um, like open in trying to see how to uh, work more with faith-based organizations. You know, they've created these networks of faith-based organizations. They've been having discussions on, uh, on, on how to give more visibility to the work that these organizations are doing on, on, on a global level. We think that we de there's definitely need for, you know, an allocation of funding from these countries to ensure that, you know, some of all, um, all the, the opportunities that I've shared just now, you know, you know tra are translated into action uh, in the countries. Also organizations like the Global Fund, other multilateral and intergovernmental intergovern organizations or forums need to invest more in, in, in ensuring that, you know, these become um, a reality. There's a need for more global platforms and forums for networking, for collaboration. Um, the AHIMSA um, fund and the AHIMSA partners is one. Um, and we think there's a need for more platforms and forums like that. Um, there's a need for more collaboration, more partnerships, whether it's at local, national or global levels, you know. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, it, it, this is 
to serve humanity, you know, and we need to see how to work more with each other to um, ensure that there's a better and you know, stronger community resilience. There's a need for more knowledge exchange and advocacy um, between all the various stakeholders, academics, policymakers, practitioners, etc. Et and I'm thankful to, you know, the RC, ST, um, um, of the Hum Humboldt University for organizing this conference. We need more platforms like this to be able to share ideas and, you know, exchange knowledge and hopefully to see, to propose, you know, um, policy reform and hopefully see that um, all of these are truly translated into action. Um, to conclude, I'll just share that, you know, there have been many opportunities to elevate and prioritize the role that faith-based organizations play in the management and response to infectious disease outbreaks or epidemics. But we need, uh, I, and, and I mean, there have been many opportunities to also elevate their role and impact in achieving the SDGs. But we need to go beyond the rhetoric. We need to go into last, to, we need to see last long in, uh, long lasting, sorry, reforms and actions um, so that we can um, indeed keep our world healthier and safer, especially for religious and faith-based communities in low-risk settings. I'll just, um, these are our references. I'll just end by, um, inviting you all to the AHIMSA um, virtual conference that starts on June 24, um, from June 22 to June 20, 25th, 2021. On the 24th, we'll be having an, uh, uh, a session on COVID-19 and faith-inspired organizations where we'll have Kathleen Mashal with leaders from um, the various faith-based organizations on the screen. You're invited to join the conversation. Thank you very much for having us. We look forward to, you, to the discussion and to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much to Ezekiel and Tanvi for your presentation. There's some reactions there, people that give you a hand of applause. So thank you very much for that informative presentation. Um, one of the recommendations was um, more opportunities for knowledge exchange. And while we are all together, as academics, practitioners, policy makers, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to exchange some knowledge by also posting your comments and asking some questions. In the chat function, we already had or have a question. It's from Jean Francois. Thanks for your presentation. My question How do you see the engagement of young generation? your generation in such an initiative. So there's yes. a question to you guys. Uh, yes, thank you, John Francois, for, for the question. Um, I mean, as young people, we, you know, we're, we're, we're very um, dynamic. We are, um, you know, I, I guess we could say that we're also quite innovative and um, we are um, disruptive sometimes in the kind of um, approaches that we propose. And I think this is how, you know, really how young people can play a part in, 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 um, in seeing how we can um, achieve some of, you know, the pr um, propositions that we made, the recommendations that we've shared. Um, we, we need to, um, as much as we can also engage, right? Um, the challenge I think for us has always been that young people are not usually not very much in, in, engaged in these sort of conversations, whether it's in policy making or even in um, getting work done on the ground in various countries. So, you know, we do need um, all the various um, uh, powerful stakeholders to um, give more voice to young people to share their ideas, um, to especially especially those of them who are um, who are tech savvy, you know, to use technology to see how to either improve um, the exchange of ideas and knowledge um, across communities and, and, and globally, or to um, plug in gaps with new new ideas, you know, with new solutions, um, you know. We talked about accountability, for example, there are new technological platforms and solutions you can use in blockchain that you can use to ensure that, you know, um, funding generated is, um, there's accountability in how these funds are, are, are utilized 
and, and ensuring that the uh, new the communities uh, uh, that they have been allocated or generated for. There's so many other you know new ideas and new ways that we can we can see how to to achieve this. So I think this is the role that young people can play. Tanvi, if you want to chime in, share a few ideas or words. Thank you, Ezekiel, um, for your response. I'm going to ask Maria. Maria, can you perhaps mute your microphone? There's coming noises through from your side. Um, Tanvi, are you satisfied with that response of Ezekiel? Do you want to add maybe something? No, that was, that was uh, he covered pretty much everything, but just a quick thing that I'd like to add is uh, just elaborate on the part that the young generation can be rather quite innovative in the way they approach things. So that is something that can be definitely leveraged. And once we are given such a platform where we can collaborate with um, uh, you know, the various stakeholders, maybe we can uh, think of more innovative ways to reach these communities and address some of the challenges that are being faced right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanvi. And then there's another question to the two of you from um, Deidre, Julius. In Africa, particular South African context, thousands of such FBOs has raised up to assist the community um, regarding yeah, the yeah, organizations. Yeah. Without the funding support, these organizations remain welfare regarding soup kitchens, providing once a week food, etc. How do these organizations overcome? International funding would be ideal, but how to go about this? Thank you for both insightful presentations. So there's a question. Um, Deidre, if you want to add something, I will give you an opportunity to add to your question. But if you're satisfied with that question, we're going to ask Ezekiel and Tanvi to respond. I'm quite, I'm, I'm quite satisfied with the, with the question. I just wanted to, before, before uh, the answer, um, Tandi also just uh, in her presentation mentioned religion and faith, and it was quite interesting that religion and faith is separately in that regard. But yes, um, that's my question. Thank you. Is it Kevin Tanvi? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the first um, question. I mean, as we as we shared, right? Um, I th I think first of all, um, you know, th th this is th there's a there's a need to be able to elevate and showcase, you know, the work that these organisations are doing. I think this sometimes this is where the challenge is. We don't we don't hear these stories. We don't know that they are happening. And so, you know, those who can support these grassroots um, faith-based um, organizations in these communities do not know that they exist and so they cannot support them. So um, again, as I was saying, there's an opportunity for, you know, using like technology platforms to keep telling these stories so that more people hear them and hopefully more people can support. Um, hope There's also an opportunity for private-based funders to see how to address this challenge. Unfortunately, unfortunately again, you know, this is it's not typical for Private private funders to um, fund um, faith based organizations. It's not it's not it's not usually something that we see a lot, and um, we think that um, or at least I, I, you know I think personally very much that um, you know we need to see how to create these inroads, you know, from grassroots organizations to um, whether it's some um, corporate based um, you know. Uh, um, uh, for-profit um, private funders or even non-for-profit private funders, you know, um, there needs, they needs to, first of all, there needs to be also a way to, to, to show an alignment of values, you know. Um, sometimes organizations cannot talk to each other because um, it's hard to articulate um, the added value for um, both partners in whatever engagement that they're going to go into. And this is something that we, we need to we, we need to see happen, you know, um, for that more of that funding to come. And as I also shared, international um, funders, international organizations have not really 
um, been doing the work they need to do to ensure that monies that are allocated go to these grassroots organizations. They usually end up in middleman organizations, they end up in intermediaries. At the end of the day, they do not really get to the you know, leaders, the organizations that are serving in you know, closest to the communities. And this is a big problem. We need to keep speaking up about this you know, to, to ensure that there's a, there's a change. Um, we have some of, um, we have Dr. Arian, not named the audience. I don't know if you want to add to this, sir. Uh, um, I don't know if any of the other um, uh, co uh, other experts from Brazil and Indonesia and the audience, but also if um, Jean Francois or uh, Olivia or Tanvi also want to add to this, please. Uh, Thank you, Chico. Tanya, um, Tan Tanvi, you can respond. Yeah. So I was, I was just going to respond to the second part of the question. I think Ezekiel responded to the first pretty well. Uh, in terms of why we mentioned faith and religion uh, separately as two different words, from, our, from my perspective at least, uh, these two can be used, uh, should be used separately because a religion is what I believe when uh, it involves maybe there is a God or a deity that people follow and um, they believe in, while faith can be also based on simply the teachings or learnings that uh, a person or somebody, they don't have to be, a, um, you know, a God or any supernatural creature, but just a normal uh, human being who probably uh, disseminates those learnings and teachings. And sometimes, I mean, of course, in religion, there is the there is a faith that you are trying uh, to show, exhibit through religion, but I don't think they can be used interversibly in every situation. That's what I would like to add. Thank you, Tanvi. Um, Deidre, are you satisfied? Thank you. All right. Yes, then we have another thank you very much. Then we have another comment from Maria. She said, thank you for an insightful and interesting presentation. Lesson learned from your context is useful for us in other contexts. So this, that is just a comment. Thank you very much for that, Maria. Any other questions from your side? Francois speaking. Can you hear me, Jean Francois? Jean Francois, you can go yeah, ahead. Yeah, thank you, Jack. Uh, now, I just want to mention one point which is very important for us uh, uh, at, at IMSA is the fact that um, uh, the role of the faith and the religious communities in the um, universal health approach and universal health success for the poorest population in the world is key. Uh, and I mean, having been used and being used to work a lot with um, the big international global health partnership like UNAIDS or Stop TB partnership or Robac Malaya, I am very surprised to see that the faith communities are never represented in those partnerships. We have the uh, private sector constituencies, we have the civil society constituencies, we have the NGOs constituencies. But if we want to reach the universal health coverage approach, we will need to work with religious communities because they are the very few who are working very closely with the most vulnerable population. And one of the reasons for which we, we decided to work on that project is really faith re religious communities and faith communities have to be part of the big international global health partnership. Over. Thank you. Thank you. That is very, very, very important. So thank you for that contribution, Jean Francois. Um, may, I, may I perhaps ask um, you um, why did you actually focus on Brazil, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka? Why the th why those three? Maybe maybe. Uh... Ezekiel, you want to answer? 
Yes, you can answer, or even uh, if you can... No, uh, don't interrupt, please um, answer. Uh, no, the idea was just to say that we it's not the question of Brazil, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka. It's a question of working with different religious communities and to show that you can be Christians, you can be Muslims, you can be uh, Buddhist. The vision that you are using to care about an outbreak and to care about the vulnerable population are similar. And we wanted to show that working with different faith communities in order to try or to in order to opposite them we can find ways to have commonalities together which is carrying the most vulnerable population and that's the reason for which we have chosen those three different faiths thank you thank you for that okay so that is clear then we also have two comments, uh, excellent presentation, that is from Titus, and then Beatrice also said, wonderful presentation, very re relevant to my research. Um, and then Deirdre also said, for the International Global, Global Health Partnership, would one find the website with this name? Would one find the website with this name? Is that the question, Deirdre? Yes, yes, it is, um, Jacques. I'm just asking, um, uh, Jean-Francois said that um, such organizations, grassroots organizations, need to belong to the International Global Health Partnership. So I'm asking, is that the name that one search for the website to get more information? Okay, there's Jean-Francois sent a link in the website. So I think that, that, might, be, that might help us. Um, Francois, I think you only sent it to me. You can send it to everyone. Okay. Uh, you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I. Yeah. Um, I will send it. I will send it to you. I would. Yeah, Ezekiel, you can do it. Uh, oh, no, actually, I, I, um, huh? I wanted to make a quick request. If yeah. I wanted to ask if um, Doctor. Dr. Ari Adnatne could say a few words because um, he's also one of the co-authors. I just wanted to just share some insights before we before we close. Over okay. to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Ezekiel. Uh, really privileged to be uh, participating at this uh, uh, important meeting today, and thank you for the excellent presentation on behalf of all of us. So basically, our approach uh, as a organization inspired by Buddhist uh, tradition has been to uh, articulate a very inclusive uh, vision at this time to to interrupt the transmission of COVID-19 and also to address some of the social uh, issues that were emerging from stigma to discrimination, mm -hmm. but based on the teachings of uh, um, uh, Buddhism. But we had a very multi-faith approach and uh, I think the paper also captured some of the work that we had been doing. Uh, the, with regard to one of the comments or questions that have been raised uh, uh, in, on the involvement of children and and young people, I think it's very important and uh, especially when the schools are closed and uh, even the youth are wanting to contribute to uh, the process of uh, controlling COVID-19 but really not having the opportunities here, we were able to bring the uh, faith leaders, religious leaders to come and reflect uh, on the challenges and then find ways of communicating with each other and also looking at the, the, the teachings of each religion in a deeper way, how to create a healthy society, what you can do from hygiene practices to uh, nutrition to uh, improving immunity and so we were able to relook at the teachings, the basic teachings of each religion, uh, taking this as a challenge. So that's what we are still trying to do. Now we are in lockdown with exponential increase in number of deaths and um, in that context we see the role of religious leaders so vitally important and I'm glad that it got this uh, international uh, uh, platform to uh, present the experience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Isakil, and thank you, everyone. Uh, over. Thank you, Dr. Vinya, and thank you, John Francois, for sharing those website links um, with us. I want to say thank you to Jennifer, who presented first, and I also want to say thank you to Ezekiel and Tanvi, and then John Francois and Dr. Vinay that also contributed. I think it was a wonderful first session and the start of this conference. Um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the week and fruitful engagement. We're going to take a short break of 30 minutes, a coffee break. 
um, so you can make your own coffee and then you can enjoy it and then we will see each other again in 30 minutes time remember there's another parallel session and that will be parallel session number two so let's give them a hand of applause for this wonderful session we just had thank you very much to each and every one of you